My mum knows that I think I'm um, a full stop's rude. And my friends would never text me a full stop because I'd be like, well, what did I do? Like, you mad at me. Why would someone be mad at you? I don't know. But it's because it's just so formal because we just text as if we're talking. Are you as baffled as I am to learn that using full stops in a text makes teens think you're angry with them? When did that become a thing? That was my friends at the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia chatting to one of their younger staff members about communication styles. But whether it's written like a text or spoken, it turns out that language is really having a moment. Yes, folks, speech is breaking free and not everyone is happy about it. I've had people tell me that, you know, the word H makes them feel like they're covered in fire ants, one speaker even said. You know, it... it makes their toes curl it's you know it sounds like fingernails grating on a, on a blackboard people describe their pet hates in all sorts of very visceral ways because slang was originally underworld cant or underworld jargon that's kate burridge a linguist at monash university and a fellow of the academy of the social sciences in australia this is Seriously Social and I'm Ginger Gorman. That word you love now, it might go in and out of fashion because new words are emerging all the time. And sometimes there's an obvious catalyst for it. Kate has previously written about the fact that in the past, hard times have often brought an influx of new language because actually wordplay brings us a form of comfort. Maybe that's why the pandemic brought us so many new words. Remember covid and quarantinis. And it wasn't just the English language changing to accommodate COVID either. The Germans came up with hundreds of new words. One of my favourites was overzoomed. So when you're stressed by too many video calls, I guess the Aussie equivalent is probably Zoom fatigue. Another one I heard bandied around a little bit is Corona angst. And of course, as Australians, we are no strangers to a little bit of wordplay. You know, Australians love their slang. They, some of them, many of them even love the swearing. Uh, they have this great love of the larrikin, you know, this... but. We love our rules as well, and it, I, th- I find it quite interesting that Australians write letters of complaint to newspapers worrying about the state of the language and complaining about the state of the language more than British English speakers and more than American English speakers. So this sort of urge to clean up the language, this kind of verbal hygiene, uh, is very much a part of Australia, um, despite this kind of... Um, This love of the vernacular, this love affair we've had with the vernacular since the beginning. Kate told me that our use of colloquial language is actually speeding up the pace of change in Australian English. Change generally is speeding up now in the English-speaking world, and there are a whole lot of factors to do with that. I mean, basically we're coming, I suppose, you know, off the back of 300 years of a rate of slowing down. So rate of change is never constant. Because we've had dictionaries, because we've had style guides and grammar books as standard language, and that has really slowed down the rate of change. In fact, it's even reversed some major, particularly pronunciation changes that were you know, happening. I mean, you think of the lost T in often, which many people now pronounce as often. That's one example of hundreds of where people are restoring spelling pronunciations because of the clout of the written word. So the T would have dropped, you know, long ago as it did in Glisten and Hasten, but it's now coming back because of the power of the written word. Then along came the internet, and like a lot of things in our lives, language began to change very, very quickly. So now when you've lost the power of the written word, you've got electronic communication, you've got, yes, this great informality in the English-speaking world, you've got, yeah, colloquialization, a horrible lot of isations. So that is kind of loosening, I suppose, if you could think of it as the straitjacket of writing or something. You know, speech is breaking free again, as it did in the Middle Ages and just doing its own thing. Uh, and But it, you're quite right about Australian English. I mean, we've always had... You know, greater informality, a kind of colloquial idiom has been such a part of the lingo right from the beginning. And you can see early commentaries when English first arrived in this country, where it was clearly a marker of a what they used to describe as a, 
an old chum versus a new chum. So if you're an old chum, you've been here for a while, you know, you speak the lingo. And if you're a new arrival, then you know quickly to speak the lingo. Otherwise, you're, you're branded as a new arrival and not one of the gang. That's really so, interesting, though, isn't it, that it's always been used as a marker, hmm. a marker of class, but also a marker of are you inside or outside this particular social circle? Yes. Do you understand this community? Are you us or are you them? <laughs> exactly. And if you think of the original um, purpose of slang, which was as underworld cant, underworld uh, jargon, then that was very much, you know, it was a secret language. It was very much an insider language. And, you know, the police were always trying to crack crack the code in early times. And it's not a coincidence that the first dictionaries were, in fact, dictionaries of colloquialisms because of that reason, you know, dictionaries of Kant. I have to admit that I love a little bit of Aussie slang. I'll be there in one shake of a wet frog. Kate has her own favourites, though. I love the word dag and always have, and I loved the journey it took from the, you know, backside of a Derbyshire sheep to sort of the current uh, Australian dag. I'm never really quite sure what a dag is, and perhaps I think I've been trying to figure it out ever since a student described me as a dag, you know, I'm like, what? not exactly did the student mean by that, but sort of, I think, unfashionable, I don't know, uncool, I'm not sure, but uh, it's a lovely word. It's not a, I know it's not a, it's not a sneer term in that respect, but it's a, it's a, it's a gentle kind of It's word. a loving, affectionate <laughs> insult. <laughs> well, that's what I thought too. Yeah. <laughs> we had a good relationship, I thought. Yes. <laughs> but I also love, I don't know, something like rort, which is also, you know, a part of Australian English. Uh, and it now, I think, has a, a rather the dubious honour of appearing in the ta- international tax glossary as a uniquely Australian word. But, you know, it was around in early British English. It comes from rorty, which meant, you know, jolly, um, lively, so a rorty party. And a rort then was a, was a jolly party. So that journey from jolly party to dodgy racket or scheme is a really interesting shift. And I think that's why expressions and words and the journeys they take are just so fascinating because they do give us, don't they, these lovely insights, lovely windows into attitudes and the society at the time. Speaking of attitudes and society at the time, one of the tragic outcomes of the colonisation and the displacement of First Nations people is the impact on language. But there is so much more to this story than many of us might realise. I'm Gamilaroi from Tamworth. The language situation when I was in school was pretty abysmal. Like, we didn't learn any language at school. My family didn't grow up speaking language, only sort of a few words here and there. Paul Williams is a linguist at the University of Queensland. He describes his journey to becoming a linguistics researcher as accidental. He did well in French at high school, so he kept studying it at university. Then he did linguistics as an elective, and that's where he started to learn more about Indigenous languages. And it's a similar story for his colleague, also a linguist at the University of Queensland, Luana Tudor-Smith. Luana was studying linguistics overseas when they suddenly realised that Aboriginal languages were what interested them. Yeah, so I sort of came into linguistics by accident as well. I went overseas uh, to South America and uh, started learning a bit of Spanish there. And then when I came back, started studying linguistics with the intention to go on to be a TESOL teacher. And then about six months into the degree, I realised that Aboriginal languages were a big study area and I thought, wow, deadly, I can learn my own languages, <laughs> study my own languages. My background is um, uh, that I grew up with my grandfather who was a first language brother speaker, but he wasn't allowed to speak uh, lingo after a certain age um, and had to speak English from then on. So I didn't grow up with much of that language and my grandmother, we now know, is Garengarang in Yemen, um, but she was disconnected from that line as well, so we didn't grow up with that language. A lot of Australians consider Indigenous languages as ancient and as something that needed to be saved from extinction. But actually, like all languages, they evolve and change. 
And that evolution has happened and continues to happen for a myriad of reasons like colonization and slavery, but also kids adapting words for their own purposes, much to the horror of their elders. Even, you know, with Indigenous indigenous people who don't know a lot of traditional language, there is still, you know, words that we use differently in terms of, like, Aboriginal English. Like deadly, like Luana was just saying. Yeah, yeah. Words like shame for people who speak Indigenous Aboriginal English. Um, have a different, it's like a slightly different connotation. There's sort of the sort of words like that that also mark the in group, you know, that dialect difference. And that's still also, even if you grow up without language, you still can sort of have, you know, feelings of, you know, connection to culture through language by the way that you use English, you know, a different way of using English. What does it mean in Aboriginal English? Well, It sort of means like if you call someone shame, they're acting like embarrassing. (laughs) What is it in standard English? It's like a bit different, isn't it? It's sort of a bit... It's close, but it's different, right? Yes. (laughs) It's evolved in Indigenous English. Yeah. The word dying is often used to describe the state of some Indigenous languages, but that's wrong. Not even close. This is Felicity Meekins, who, along with Paul and Luana, is a linguist at the University of Queensland. She's also a fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia. Words like dying, death, extinct, um, moribund, dormant, they're all biological metaphors. And um, the idea, I guess, behind that metaphor is that they can't come back. But languages aren't DNA. The way we often talk in Australia and um, across North America about languages that um, don't currently have speakers, we like to think of them as sleeping languages and languages that are being awakened. Um, And that's You know, there's a lot of energy around that in Australia at the moment, which is very exciting. We've seen some fantastic examples of languages being revived all over the world. So um, Hebrew is a classic example, Mohawk in the United States and Māori um, just in New Zealand. So um, in calling a language, saying that it's dying or it's dead or it's extinct, it's saying that it can't come back. And I think we're absolutely seeing in Australia that that's um, definitely not the case. That's Gurindji woman Rosie Smiler telling a short story in Gurindji Creole about another woman, Samantha, being jabbed by a catfish spine. But even the language she's speaking has its own story of evolution. Gurindji is a language that's spoken um, in the Victoria River District in the Northern Territory. It's come into contact with Creole. And so in the 1970s, older people were code switching between Gurindji and Creole on the cattle stations. The Creole was brought in through the cattle stations. And that next generation, um, Rosie Smiler's generation, have... um, transformed it into um, what linguists refer to as a mixed language. So it's its own language. It takes elements like words from both Gurindji and Creole. It takes parts of grammar from both Gurindji and Creole, but it um, mixes them together in entirely unique ways. And so you might have heard some words in there that you recognise, like mud, for instance, which, you know, ultimately comes from English through Creole, but there'd be an awful lot of things that you wouldn't understand in that particular way of speaking. So these languages really sit on that cusp between tradition and modernity. Of course, with some of these sleeping languages, the full word list from the past may simply not exist anymore. But what that often means is that people then get creative. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think um, in terms of language revitalization, a lot of languages don't have that full surviving word list. There are some sort of documentation and archives of words, but they might not exist in full, like the full 10,000 words that existed pre-colonization, pre-invasion. And so I think the hopes with these languages is that you can use this and, and be creative in that sort of way that these fellows who speak Gurindji Creole are creative. 
And I do know people who learn new words, then mix it in with their English, and then that's great. Use as much language as you as you can. Every time I hear lingo spoken, I feel a connection to the ancestors and to the spirits. So as much as we can use language is great. And new languages are being born and languages are alive and evolving constantly. It's a known, it happens all around the world. So this sort of stuff is inevitable where people are creative with language and languages change. To me, it's very exciting and hopeful. Felicity, particularly with Gurindji Creole, how have the elders that you've come into contact with accepted that language? How do they see it? Uh, Yeah, I think, you know, perhaps it's a bit of a universal the world over that old people don't like the way that young people speak. And so the old people feel the grief of lesser Gurindji being spoken and so they don't necessarily look very positively on the language but those views have changed quite a lot over the years and certainly the young people really hold up this language as um, as they say it's a a language for a new generation Um, and there's been you know an awful lot of change that's gone on and that language really reflects that change. I mean, and this is in every language since the beginning of time. Like I can even think of examples from my own teenage years, which I no longer use today. I remember saying terrible words like grouse, meaning great. I mean, you never hear that now, right? But it was everywhere when I was about 13. So language does have an organic way of changing, but there's a difference between that and a language being put to sleep, shall we say, or sleeping. Yes, absolutely. It depends on who's got the agency. And I think in Australia, the real issue is that um, the speakers have not had the agency and, you know, with where those languages have ended up. Here's Lawana again. Ideally, we would be practising the culture of the people whose land we're on. Uh, You know, if you go to France, it's expected that you speak in French, use the currency, practise their social norms and, you know, conform to an extent, to their way of life. So it should be the same here, really. We're sitting here today on Yaga adorable land, um, so realistically we should be practising their cultural laws and speaking in their languages. Felicity, I know that you have got funding to create dictionaries. So maybe we will see this into the future. But how hard is that going to be considering what Paul and Luana have said that some Indigenous groups don't have full word lists and they may never have them because those languages are sleeping and we don't have access to that information? At the moment in Australia, what we should be doing is getting into a kind of triaging process We need to know exactly where there are first language speakers of languages and really be targeting language and support to those languages to document them. Um, Communities are particularly interested in having dictionaries created. And then with other um, languages where there's good archival material, there needs to be different kinds of support targeted in those communities so that um, people can access those archives and pull together the records that do exist and transform them in ways that um, can be used in school programs or programs outside of school within the communities. So in good news, languages are being set free, partly by technology and evolving faster than they have for hundreds of years. And in not so good news, there needs to be more work done to help those sleeping languages be revitalised. So where does this all leave us? Maybe we should stop worrying so much about all those full stops or the lack of them. And maybe we all need to make more of an effort to connect with a teen or a 20 something just to keep up with the rapid evolution. If they want to put a full stop, I'd be like, what did I do wrong? Why are you mad at me? Because it's more formal. Like there's no full stops in text. No and what about No commas. No comment. I use a lot of exclamation marks. And what about the use of the laughing emoji? I don't use emojis. What's wrong with emojis? I just, just... <laughs> None of my friends use emojis either. Thanks for listening to Seriously Social. I'm Ginger Gorman. 
If you're enjoying the podcast, make sure you check out our website, seriouslysocial.org.au for more content and articles and videos on the amazing work of Australia's leaders in the social sciences. Next time, did you know that when you are standing in front of your pantry trying to calculate if you need more cans of tomatoes, you're actually practicing the art of forecasting? Next episode, we'll look at how these predictions shape and impact our everyday lives. See you next time. Thank you.